Okay, hello everyone. Um, today we'll be basically like well restarting the data um, lecture since we really spent a lot of time on the perception still last time, and then we will continue with the visualization alphabet. Uh, before I get started, are there any kind of like organizational questions or any other things that you would like to discuss? Okay, so then let's get started. So we talked about data um, as there's like different kind, like different ways to talk about data. We had data set types, which would be things like tables, networks, fields, or geometry, and then data types, which would be the fundamental units, how these data set types or data sets are composed. Um, so we have things like items, attributes, links, positions, and grids. Um, and we'll talk more about what these different things mean today. And then we, we distinguish between structured data and unstructured data. And I kind of mentioned that uh, structured data is really what we care about in data visualization. And unstructured data are things like text and video and speech and so on, that there, there's like dedicated fields to translate unstructured data into structured data, such as natural language processing, text mining, object recognition, uh, or like object tracking or anything like that. Um, and then we walked through some of these examples and this is basically as far as we got. Um, so I want to continue um, talking a little bit about the, the semantics of the data. So for example, um, I have this data vector here, basal, seven, S, and pair. And so any ideas of what that might mean? So it can be anything, right? Like it, we don't know, basal could be like um, the herb, seven could be like, I don't know, uh, it, it, it doesn't really make any sense. So we need context. Semantics kind of like give us the real word meaning um, of uh, a data vector. Is it a name, a city, a fruit? Is it height, age, day of the month? Um, and this is contained in metadata. And so for this particular example, this is a vector from a table of people uh, where we have things like an ID, a name, age, shirt size, and favorite fruit. And basil uh, is one of the items in that data table. Um, so a quick note about data types, um, like what, when I'm talking about data types, I'm not talking um, uh, about kind of like the data types in programming, like integers, floats, uh, or strings. I'm talking about the structural and mathematical interpretation of the data. Are things items, links, attributes, positions, or grids? Um, so like an items are, um, are like individual entities. They are discrete. Um, you can think of this also as the independent variable. Um, so that would be something like an individual entity, like a patient, a car, a stock, a city, a country, anything that I kind of like, uh, that, that is discrete and that I can observe. Uh, and attributes are observed or logged properties or measured properties of these items. So like a patient would have a height, a blood pressure, a car would have horsepower or a make or like a, a mileage or anything like that. And so these are the dependent variable. And just this is like a uh, dependent variable because these log properties that depend on the independent variables, uh, so they cannot exist uh, independently of the independent variable. Um, and so if you look at this, uh, where are our independent variables or our items here? It's in the rows. The rows here are like the items. They are the um, the independent variables. Um, so here we have the person uh, being the um, the independent variable, and then we have the attributes about those people are the dependent variables. Um, and then we have like a cell that identifies the intersection here. Uh, we also have other data types um, such as links, positions, and grids. Links express relationships between two items. So for example, this is important in all kinds of networks, so for example, such as social networks, a friendship and network connects two people um, with a link or interactions between proteins connects those two proteins with a link. Uh, positions are important for spatial data. It's the location in 2D or 3D. It could be uh, things like a pixel in a photo, the voxels, the 3D pixel in an MRI scan, or the latitude and longitude on a map. Uh, and grids are related, but not quite the same thing. Uh, grids are basically a sampling strategy for continuous data. So if you have an MRI, you have like a discrete number of voxels in an MRI scan. 
uh, and you have a grid at one, along which these are aligned. But you could also think of the, uh, this would be most likely a very regular grid, but this, uh, positions of the weather stations in the US would also be a grid, but that would be uh, a less uh, regular grid. So let's talk about the data set types again, tables, networks, fields, and geometry. So tables are the one that we are probably all most familiar with. We can have flat tables where we have one item per row. Each column here has an attribute, then we have a unique key. Uh, that unique key can be explicit, uh, as we had it earlier in the example with Basil, or it can be implicit uh, by essentially being the, the row number. Um, and uh, you should typically, like, uh, don't allow duplicates in the table, although that depends a little bit on this, the specific context. Um, and you can also have multi-dimensional tables where you index based on multiple keys. And I'll give you an example of that. So here's a flat table. We have the item again. Then we have all of the, uh, the values uh, and the attributes again. And then here we have our explicit keys. Okay, and so here would be an example of a multi-dimensional table. Um, I have um, the keys here. This is like a, a list of gene expression data uh, for, uh, for patients and for genes. So we have the keys here are patients. And then we could have like uh, the, uh, the, the keys are patients, the keys are genes. And then we can stack multiple of these runs on top of each other. So we could kind of like measure different things. Uh, we could measure this at multiple time points and multiple locations and so on. And that's that way we stack that and then we, we generate a multi-dimensional table. So how can we visualize data? Uh, well, there's lots of dedicated visualization techniques. So you see um, a technique called parallel coordinates here on the left. Parallel coordinates kind of like have each attribute on one separate axis. And uh, then they kind of like um, wherever like the items are the lines here and then uh, the item intersect uh, at the axis that represents the attribute at the value of this attribute. So you see that I've selected some, like this is a data set with cars. Um, I've selected um, a, a couple of cars with like a miles per gallon of between 35 and 45. Um, and you can see that these cars tend to have few cylinders like low displacement, um, like medium or low horsepower low weight and they're not particularly fast, fast accelerating. Um, on the right, there is like another, like a different kind of representation, which is basically just a tabular representation uh, where like the, the magnitude of values is encoded by the size of the bubble um, and some kind of like categorical um, attribute is encoded by color. Um, so a different data uh, type would be, data set type would be collections. Um, these are things like how we group items. I see that Garrett raised his hand. Yeah, I had a question on the, uh, the last um, slide. So I've looked at these graphs on the left before and do the lines mean anything or are they more of just a easy way of marking where the value is? So the lines mean something because uh, only with the lines, it's possible to like see that item across all of these different dimensions, right? Like each line corresponds to one car. Um, and if I didn't have these lines, I couldn't see the relationship of where is that car in the first dimension and where is that car in the second dimension. Okay. So I can show you like a, this is actually interactive. Um, so if I pick this, like only those two down here, uh, or it's a couple actually. Uh, you can see that like here, this is like the same item that goes across all of these different dimensions. Um, and you can see that by the lines. And you can also see with the lines, you can also see things like inversions of trends. So for example, uh, let's see, we have, uh, here we, we have actually quite a few inversions, right? So. Uh, because these lines are crossing from the left to the right, um, they cr all of them are tend to be crossing. So we, we kind of can see that uh, we have an inverse relationship between uh, miles per gallon and number of cylinders. Um, and so we can kind of like, if you learn to read these charts, you can see, okay, if all of the lines are parallel, we, we have like a more or less linear correlation. Uh, if they're all inverse, we have like an inverse linear correlation, for example. 
Um, and so the lines are, are actually quite, quite meaningful and useful. But we'll talk more about um, these kinds of visualizations when we have like a dedicated lecture on tablet data visualization. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so uh, collections are things about how we group items. And, and so it's useful to distinguish between sets, lists, and clusters. Um, sets, um, this is also familiar from programming languages, uh, sets have unique items and they are tend to be unordered. Here in the top right, this is a technique to, uh, to highlight sets. This is a, a map of countries and then the sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa is highlighted in green uh, on top of this plot, plot. So we have these set relationships, all of these uh, countries belong to that particular set. Um, lists are uh, ordered and typically allow duplicates. Um, so here I have like a ranked list of universities um, in the middle here. Um, and then clusters are kind of related to sets, but they're also different clusters. Typically, like it's kind of ambiguous to define clusters, but uh, the best way to think about them are groups of similar items that are similar with some respect. And so um, I'm showing you kind of like a couple of Gaussian blobs down here with some clusters highlighted. Um, but it's not like clusters are not something like sets are, are like usually hard, to, like they have a specific definition, uh, whereas clusters are more like fuzzy and, and, and something like more, something that kind of emerges from the data instead of having like being a specific data type by itself. Um, another uh, important data set type are graphs and networks. So in graphs, we'll, and we'll have a dedicated lecture or like actually multiple dedicated lecture on network visualization. We have items that are connected to each other with links. The typical examples that you think of are social networks, power grids, road networks, computer chips, all of these kinds of things. There's many, many different types of networks and they're a super important data type um, and very interesting also for data visualization because they come with lots of different challenges. Now, a special type of a network is a tree. Um, the the kind of like most basic definition of a tree is a tree is a graph or a network with no cycles. Uh, but typically, we also think of trees as being rooted and directed. So in the homework two example, you had a tree, uh, kind of like a tree of life, um, that had a root and it was directed. Um, so for, for graph visualizations, we have kind of like three major types of visualizations. We have like node link diagrams that show uh, networks in the, in the kind of probably most familiar type, like we have nodes um, that are kind of dots uh, or like uh, have some kind of mark and then we show an edge, uh, a line connecting these items. Uh, there's also adjacency matrices that show kind of like that have both uh, the items in the row and in the columns and then a filled in cell here shows an edge. Uh, and we'll talk about what the benefits and the drawbacks of those two techniques are in the lecture on graphs and trees. Um, and then for, for trees, there's um, a couple of special types of visualizations that are called implicit visualizations because they only implicitly show the structure of the network. Uh, and the most common of those is the tree map. So here we have a tree map of uh, who imported coffee in 2012. Um, and it is kind of um, the tree hierarchy here are different, um, are different regions of the world. So you have kind of Southern Europe, Northern Europe, Eastern Europe, um, they are nested in a Europe uh, quadrant. Um, and then we have North America with the United States and Canada and so on. But yeah, if this doesn't make sense, don't worry. This is just a teaser. We'll cover this in very much detail in lectures on graphs and trees. Um, fields here um, is about attributes, values that are associated with certain cells. Uh, and the cells contains data from the continuous to main. So think about this like as temperature or pressure or, or wind velocity. So like the, the typical example um, is some kind of spatial, like for example, in, in, on a map, we have all of these different weather stations that measure temperature, pressure, wind, and velocity. Um, and um, of course, like this is, um, things like temperature are continuous. There's a temperature everywhere in the world. Um, and, but we measure, measure them only in discrete points. Um, and so if we then want to infer what is the temperature, like uh, we, we have to worry about sampling and interpolation, which is kind of like an important area of signal processing and statistics. Um, so here is a, like an example of, uh, of a field visualization that is kind of like um, there's a lot of interpolation going on here. This is kind of like a very current uh, 
map of air quality across the United States, you can see kind of the effect of, uh, of the wildfires in California and Oregon and Washington on the air quality. Um, and um, like, of course, there is a lot of interpolation going on. And like, the question is, how good is this particular interpolation, if you want to read that, but um, it's kind of like, yeah, well, it's kind of an interesting map. This is from the official airnow.gov website. Um, what, like in, in fields, we have to worry a little bit about grid types. So we have things like a uniform grid where like geometry and topology can be computed. A rectilinear grid, as you can see on the cube in the top right, where we have some non-uniform sampling. Um, a structured grid, which um, is, uh, is kind of like um, well described conceptually, but also allows curvilinear grids. And then unstructured grids are things like weather stations. They have full flexibility. They have to store position and connection uh, of them. Um, so for field visualization, like the typical uh, things that you would do in field visualization are usually like medical imaging or fluid flows or simulations of combustion or things like that. Uh, or, uh, or kind of weather um, or other kinds of properties on top of maps. Um, and so we'll be covering the map aspect for the whole like um, three-dimensional data analysis aspect. There is like a separate class that specializes on this kind of data. Uh, it's called CS5635 um, uh, or 6635 visualization for scientific data. It's the companion class to this one. So here we're dealing more with abstract data in that class they're dealing more with uh, kind of like these um, three-dimensional fields and how we can render them. And those, those things are, are related, but also have very different approaches. Um, so for example, uh, scientific data visualization is a lot more related to computer graphics than information visualization, which we are mostly uh, covering in this class, which is much closer to, let's say, design and HCI and so on. Um, we will be covering maps though, um, and, and uh, there's, there's going to be a dedicated lecture on maps and how to visualize data on top of maps. Um, here's just a quick side note because I've just used these terms, information visualization, uh, scientific visualization. So historically, like the area of visualization or the field of visualization has been divided into three subfields. Information visualization, which is all about abstract data, tables, graphs, and maps. Um, it's kind of like a creative discipline because you're free to choose your spatial layout and your encoding. Um, it also perception matters, like perception research kind of traditionally also falls into that bin. Then we have the visual analytics bin, which is kind of like um, taking InfoVis and adding stats and machine learning and, and focusing on applied work and focusing on building systems. Uh, if you're cynical, you could say visual analytics is kind of like a funding buzz, buzzword to kind of like say, hey, we're now doing intelligence analysis and that kind of all happened post 9-11 uh, when this field was born essentially to open the, uh, the faucet for government funding. Um, and then we have scientific visualization, which is kind of like the oldest area of visualization maybe as an academic field, which is all about spatial data, these kinds of fields that I just talked about. Uh, and typically this is, a, you're, you don't, can, you can't choose your spatial layout freely because you, you know, like the space is kind of like what you're actually displaying. And it's really about how finding the best way to depict reality. Um, and if you wanted to like essentially uh, build a classification algorithm, if a visualization is information visualization or scientific visualization, uh, you could like, this is of course a joke, uh, you could just say, hey, is it a white background? Then it's InfoVis, is the black background and it's Cybis. Uh, these are just Google searches for those two different terms here. Okay, uh, end of the detour. Uh, now, next uh, data uh, type is geometry. Geometry is the shape of items. Uh, we have like explicit spatial positions here. And what, what we care about is points, lines, curves, surfaces, regions, or volumes. Um, this is more of a, a computer graphics or a computer aided design uh, topic. It's not really a core topic in visualization. Uh, we will be using some of this stuff, geometry, especially in the context of maps. So we will be using geometry files to create maps and to draw data on top of maps. But we don't, we're not going to look at essentially like renderings of a Stanford bunny or uh, of an engine like you can see or some differential as you can see here in the, in the bottom right. Okay, now let's talk about attribute types. 
Um, so attribute types is it really about the question, which classes of values and measures are there? We have like these, these high level uh, attribute types are categorical uh, uh, or quantitative. Um, and, and then you can also distinguish um, ordered categorical. So categorical or nominal um, is our data uh, attributes where you only can compare equality and you can't make any kind of like inferences about order or magnitude or anything like that. So for example, different types of fruit, different types of gender, movie genres, file types, and so on. So you can really like, there's no ranking or anything like that. Um, it is just um, separate classes. Um, whereas order types um, are, um, there are there, you can still not define um, any like explicit greater or um, you cannot ex uh, define explicit quantities, but you can define whether something is larger or smaller. For example, you can have shirt sizes like um, small, medium, X large, large, uh, or, or rankings or car classes. So these, there is no explicit, like this is three times as large, uh, but there is an order to them. And then we have quantitative attributes where we can do like ar ar arithmetic. Uh, these are things like length, weight, count, and temperature. And it's important to kind of distinguish those because uh, depending on which attribute types you have, very different visual encodings are appropriate. So uh, for example, quantitative attributes are like have vastly different um, uh, visual encodings that are, uh, that are reasonable than categorical attributes. And this is gonna be like the second part of today's lecture. Um, and we then can further distinguish quantitative data types um, more into interval and ratio types. Um, so uh, interval types are, are kind of like um, um, where we have no specific meaningful zero. So there are equal differences between successive points on the scale, but the position of zero is arbitrary. Um, and so like the, the, the trick to, to distinguish interval from ratio type um, is to ask the question, does zero mean none? So does a date of, um, let's say, year zero mean this, there is no, this is not, like there is none of the date? Or does the temperature of zero degrees Celsius mean there's no temperature? Um, and if the answer is, um, uh, is, is no, then it's an interval scale. So uh, we, so basically, uh, a good example of this is the difference between uh, temperature in Celsius and in Fahrenheit. Uh, we have basically arbitrary zero points. Like for, for, for Celsius, the zero point here is, uh, the freeze, is, is the freezing point of water. For Fahrenheit, it is some kind of like complicated um, salinity, uh, uh, salinous solution when that freezes. Um, some people are choking that. Fahrenheit simply said, oh, it's never going to get colder than today. And that was the zero point of his uh, temperature scale. And so you cannot compare them directly. You can really only compare differences. So it doesn't make sense to say, hey, it's twice as hot today than it was yesterday if it was like uh, 40 degrees yesterday and 80 degrees uh, today. Um, ratio data types, in contrast, uh, here the relative magnitude of scores and the differences between them matter. The position of zero is fixed. So zero has meaning. There's nothing of the measured entity observed. So for example, if I have like a distance or, or length of zero, then there's simply nothing there. If I have a mass of zero, there's nothing there. If I have age of zero, uh, then there's nothing there. Weight or speed are other examples. And here I can measure ratios and proportions. So something being twice as far is a meaningful thing or twice as heavy or twice as old because the zero point here is meaningful. I can measure ratio and proportions. So this is kind of the summary of these different data types. Um, in nominal categorical values or labels, uh, we only can check for equality or lack of equality. In ordinal data types, we, they, these are ordered categorical. Uh, we can measure for equality, but also if it's greater or smaller than. For interval data, where the location of zero is arbitrary, we can check for equality, we can check, uh, check whether it's smaller or larger than, and we can do um, additions and subtractions. And then for ratio, where we have a fixed zero point, we can do also proportions, multiplications, and divisions, and so on. Okay, so 
quick quiz. Um, and you can either shout it out or type it into the, uh, into the chat. Um, what uh, type of variable, nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio are the following? 50 meter race time. See a lot of people are typing ratio. Yeah, ratio is correct. Now, college major, is it normal, ordinal, interval, or ratio? Nominal, everybody seems to be correct here. Uh, the Amazon rating for a product. So we have all kinds of different answers. We have interval, ordinal, or ratio. Yeah, that's a good question. It's not completely clear, right? I would say um, it could, you could think of it as probably interval. It's not that, uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily meaningful to say that something is uh, twice as good if it gets five stars instead of uh, 2.5 stars. Uh, but it, it, is a, it is a tricky one. What about IQ score? I see a mix of ratio and intervals. Um, I would argue that uh, an IQ score is interval because like there is no meaningful zero, right? Uh, IQ scores start somewhere. IQ scores are also tricky because they they don't really measure intelligence in general. So for example, my cat would certainly score zero on an IQ test, but it still is not like, it, it does not have no intelligence at all, right? So uh, IQ scores are, in my opinion, interval. We can kind of like make judgments about uh, differences, but we can't say, hey, 120 is twice as intelligent as 60. Uh, the name of a product, nominal, yeah. That's an easy one. Okay, great. Thanks for participating. Uh, so one other important distinction here uh, is uh, sequential versus diverging data. Uh, so sequential data is, is essentially homogeneous from a minimum to a maximum. So it would be some, something like the number of people in the country, and that would be sequential data set. A diverging data set would be uh, where I have two or multiple sequences that meet. Uh, so the typical example for that would be an elevation data set. I would have elevation above sea level and elevation below sea level. Or a temperature of water, it could be below or up above uh, freezing or boiling. So these could be um, like meaningful diverging uh, color scale or scales. So here is an example. Anybody can spot anything in that, um, um, in that figure here? So this is a continuous color or like a rainbow color scale actually um, applied to a diverging data set. And it's really hard to see something here. But if I do like a proper color scale, a diverging color scale, I can actually see that this is, uh, that is, this is uh, elevation above and below sea level. And I can see like um, Florida and the Gulf Coast here. Um, there's of course other structure in data. Um, for example, data can be cyclic. Um, we have like we like time is as we experience it um, as we live it is cyclic. We have hours, weeks, months, and years. Um, so here in the top right um, is um, a nice visualization, like a spiral visualization of um, when do diseases occur. Um, so like and this is like uh, you can see like in the in the first one we have a pattern, a 25 day pattern. In the right one we have a 28 day pattern where the like weekdays line up nicely. And what we can see here is that, let me annotate this quickly, that here, like the Mondays line up nicely and this is where people go to the doctor. Um, and so this is when we record these diseases. And this is of course also what we see in, in, if you look at any kind of COVID charts, uh, we always see that um, like the number of uh, cases drop um, uh, at, on the weekend and then on Monday people uh, get tested more frequently and then we have like the increase in incidences. And so if you like in this case here, like if we sm are smart about aligning it, then you can see these patterns easily. But if you align it by five days, these patterns are kind of like really tricky to spot. 
Um, and uh, then uh, there's also the question about aggregations. You have, you might have patterns on multiple levels. So here at the bottom, um, I'm showing kind of like a long-term and a short-term pattern of Google Analytics um, uh, page hits of the, the Viz course website. Um, and you can see like a long-term pattern that essentially, um, again, let me annotate, that uh, in the summer, there's basically and nobody visiting and then the semester here starts up um, and then we have like uh, lots of hits. Whereas if we look at a daily um, pattern, we can see here again, weekends very well. So this is like weekdays, weekend, weekday, weekend, weekday, weekends. And, and so that keeps going. So these patterns like you, you um, diff like same data, different scales reveals different patterns. Okay. So let's let's look at this table here. Uh, we have just this is a recap. We have here in this case, I'm highlighting an item, an element, or an independent variable. These are all like in uh, these are all terms that are used interchangeably. Um, then here I have an attribute, which is also often called a dimension or a dependent variable or a feature. Again, these terms are used interchangeably. Uh, then up there, I have the semantics, like what, are, what is the meaning of these different um, attributes? Like we have product container, order priority, product base margin and ship date. And now like feel free to speak out or like write in the chat, where are the keys here? We have keys. A lot of people saying order ID. Exactly, ID doesn't work because there are duplicates. In fact, the keys here are the, like implicit, they're the row number. Uh, what are the different attribute types? What, are, what is the attribute type of order ID? Is it interval, ratio, ordinal, or nominal? A lot of people say ordinal. Um, it could be ordinal. Um, it probably is ordinal, but it could also be nominal. It, it doesn't really, like the ID is probably some kind of like by implementation sequential, but the uh, order is probably not particularly important. Oh, what about the order date? Interval ratio, nominal. I see a lot of interval and ordinal. ordinal. I, I would say it's interval. Uh, what about order priority? Yeah, order priority, I guess I see a lot of ordinal responses. Ordinal is clearly uh, ordinal. We can, or we can sort them, but it's not necessarily that uh, like um, four is twice as important than um, and high and uh, so clearly like an ordinal data type. Uh, product container. Yeah, it's, it's mostly ordinal. It could be, there could be like, we kind of infer a size, but it's not completely clear. So you could say ordinal. I would probably agree with ordinal. And then finally product base margin. Yeah. A lot of responses with ratio, and so that is correct. Um, here, I've kind of like um, separated it out in categorical, ordinal, and quantitative. Okay, um, great. So, um, one thing that is also important is to distinguish data versus a conceptual model. So, the data model is a low level description of the data. Uh, we have operations that we can apply them. So, for example, we can do additions, subtractions, and so on on floats. The conceptual model is kind of like the semantics and the reasoning about it. So the data model would be I have 1D floats, the conceptual model would be I have temperature, or data model would be I have 3D vector of floats, the conceptual model would be space. Um, and we can actually uh, go from a data model, like here we have some numbers, uh, to a conceptual model of temperature, to a data type, uh, it's, it's, uh, is it um, quantitative, continuous to four significant digits, is it ordinal, hot, warm, or cold? Or it could be even nominal if I, in, in, in the right context, is like 
my toast burned or not burned or frozen or anything like that. Um, okay. Um, and then in reality, of course, um, data is complicated. We very frequently have combinations or derived data. So for example, networks aren't just networks. Usually they also have attributes like a social network has people who have names, who have ages. Um, we can measure how frequently an interaction happens and so on. Attributes have hierarchies. Data types can be transformed uh, between uh, different, uh, like I can, as I just mentioned, I can transform temperatures into meaningful concepts. So real life is complicated. Um, this is a useful framework to think about data, but in reality, very often things are a little bit more messy and compound um, and, uh, and derived in some way. Um, so that wraps up the data lecture and I'm just gonna continue with the lecture on marks and channels. Okay, so um, now I wanna try something. Um, this is about like um, the visualization alphabet, how we can like encode data on a screen or on paper or whatever. Um, try, like, I don't know whether this works, but try to draw on, on my shared screen. Uh, can you guys annotate, does that work? So I would like you, okay, great. So <laughs> uh, draw on my screen. Um, how can I represent two numbers, for example, four and eight? Try to draw different ways of how I can represent four and eight. I'll start. Uh, there is like if you have your uh, yeah, you option annotate. Okay, I see some uh, like um, points appearing. Uh, there's a pie chart. We have bar charts. We have kind of like tick marks. We have a line chart. We have explicit number like uh, writing four and eight. Uh, we have a stacked bar chart. Uh, we have uh, encoding by area. Uh, we have like a hybrid font size and glyph encoding with four and eight. Cool, this works pretty well. Any other ideas? One thing that's a little um, tricky to do in even in this annotation here is we could do things like um, the, the opacity of or the, the darkness of a color. Um, like pie charts are essentially angles, right? Um, so we have all of these different things. Great, so I'll clear the annotations. Um, okay. Great. Okay. So, so yeah, very, very, very cool. Um, so, um, there's lots of different ways to encode data, and this is what all of this lecture is going to be about. Uh, we call this marks and channels uh, or visual variables. So a mark represents an item. Remember, the item is the independent variable, like a person or a link, uh, which is like in a network. Um, the channels change the appearance of the mark based on an attribute. So the channel encodes the um, encodes the dependent variable, the attribute that I observe. And channel, uh, like I'm gonna use these two terms interchangeably, channel or visual variable, just so you're aware. If I say visual variable or channel, they mean the same thing. Um, and so like what are kind of the typical marks that we use? These are the basic geometric elements. So we have things like points or lines or areas or volumes. Um, volume is, is a mark that works, but it's, well, that exists, but it's rarely used in, in visualization. Um, for links, we have separate marks. We have containment uh, and connection. Those are the two marks that I have for links. And so 
these encode the existence of an item. And then, uh, well, containment here can, for example, also be nested. This is here like a, a special kind of Euler diagram uh, that we'll talk about when we talk about set visualization. Um, and uh, complementary to these marks, we have the channels that kind of control the appearance proportional to or based on an attribute of these items. Um, and here we have things like position, shape, size, color, tilt, volume, area, kind of the stuff that you all just drew on my screen or on, on our shared screens. And this kind of historically goes back to um, this, this guy, Jacques Pertin, who is a French cartographer who passed away in 2010. And he wrote this very, very influential book um, in our community, The Semiology of Graphics in 1967. And he kind of like described these theoretical principles for visual encodings. Um, this is like a, uh, a, a figure from his book. Um, it was, the book is in French. Um, so I left the original here and I annotated English labels on top of it. So he described position, size, the gray value, texture, color, orientation, um, and shape. And he distinguished between the marks, points, lines, and areas. And he, he was like thinking of this mostly in the, in the context of cartography, of course. Um, and so we, we kind of like, these are like visual variables that we still use today, but we of course now formalize this a little bit. Um, but now let me just um, give you some examples. Um, let's suppose I have a data set um, and um, I, I have items in the data set and I'm encoding in the first example here on the left, I'm encoding uh, the items in the data set with like the line mark of the bar chart. Um, the channel uh, I'm using here is, is the length um, of the bar, or you can also think of it as the position at the, of the upper edge of the bar. Um, so I'm encoding one quantitative attribute for the different items. Um, if I now take a scatter plot, um, uh, as you can see here, the mark is now like not no longer a line, but it's a, it is a point. Um, and the channel here is the position of these, uh, of these points, but I'm encoding two quantitative attributes. So I have separate encodings for the X and the Y uh, uh, dimension. So this could be something like a correlation of the weight and height of a person, for example. Um, I can then add another attribute, um, like um, a categorical attribute on top of it by, for example, encoding hue on top of it. This would be, is it like a grad student or an undergraduate student? Um, and then finally, I can even continue adding something to it. I could say uh, I can add size um, to these items as additional quantitative attribute, like how many classes is this person taking in this semester? Something like that. Um, and so I can, in theory, um, I have all of these different uh, channels available. In theory, I can keep adding them to the marks and making this more complex. In practice, that is often not the best idea. It does make sometimes sense to do redundant encoding. So here in this bar chart, um, I am redundantly encoding actually with three different values. I'm encoding by the length, uh, which is kind of the length of the bar. I'm encoding by the position, which is the position of the upper edge, and by the color value. Those color values correspond to the height of the bar. Um, here is a bar chart that, like, actually about um, snow at Snowbird. Um, what do you guys think about this bar chart? Like, what what what's wrong about this bar chart? The bars aren't proportional to each other. Exactly. The bars are like not at all proportional to each other, right? It looks like 17 inches is about half as much as 180 inches, which is about half as much as 656 images, uh, inches. So uh, is that actually, you see this a lot in, in cable uh, or in, in, in television, uh, these kinds of things. And I just don't know why, why you like, usually um, if you see something like this on, on like Fox News or something, uh, usually they overestimate an effect to make it more dramatic, but here they're actually under underselling it. And I don't think that this is a logarithmic scale. I think this is just like somebody doing a graphic uh, design thing. Um, I, I doubt that this would map prefer perfectly to a, a logarithmic scale. So one rule, and we'll talk more about these kinds of rules in the design lecture, use channels proportional to the data. Um, okay, so there's two different types of channels that we need to distinguish uh, based on the data types. Here, kind of like this all comes together. We have magnitude channels that are great to encode ordinal and quantitative data. Um, and then we have identity channels that are great to, uh, for categorical data. 
So magnitude channels, we have things like how much, which rank, and these are position, length, and saturation, and others. Identity channels is all about uh, identity is the what, is it like a, and the, here we would, you could use shape or color or spatial region. Um, and this is from the textbook uh, by Tamara Munzner, uh, which is, by the way, like um, really like has a very good treatment on, on this whole topic. Um, uh, and this chart here tells you like what are the different channels, um, both for magnitude and identity, and also how good are they, like how effective are they. Um, and it's, it's ranked from the most effective to the least effective. So for um, magnitude channels, we have position on a common scale um, as the most effective, position on an underland scale as the second most effective, then length, and then tilt, and then area, then depth, the 3D position, then color luminance, color saturation, curvature, and 3D volume. Um, for identity channels, we have spatial region. So like um, different regions where you uh, place something can, uh, can encode categorical attributes. So position and space are like what you can see here are the very, the, are both, in, both really great for magnitude and identity channels. Uh, and then you can use color hue um, and motion and shapes uh, for identity channels. Um, so here, let, here's a chart um, that I just want to like briefly uh, talk about what are the visual variables or the marks and channels used. We have, um, this is kind of tax rates of companies. Uh, this also shows market capitalization and how much they are being taxed. So what, what is the data and what are the, the marks and channels that are being used here? The marks are the different circles and then the channels are the circle size, color, and position. Uh, both, I'm not sure if the Y means anything, but it seems to mean something in the X. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good analysis. We have uh, the marks are the points here, um, and they are, they are the, uh, the size of the points um, is uh, a, a, a channel that encodes, in this case, the market capitalization of the chart. Uh, the position in X um, encodes the tax rate of that company. Um, the color is kind of like a redundant encoding um, of the tax rate. Um, based on like this um, discrete color scale that you see at the bottom. Um, the Y position, um, as Paul correctly identified, is probably not meaningful. So this is really just um, and kind of like to make stuff work together. Um, what I do like about this chart, and I think this is a really well-designed chart, um, and we'll do something similar for one of the later homeworks. Um, so here, like we also have what's called detail and demand. If I hover over this chart, you can see which company is that. And there's also plenty of storytelling going on here. Uh, but I can also do something else here. I can click on the view by industry and then this facets it. And now I'm using actually an, uh, uh, an um, identity channel, like position as an identity channel to show these different categories here, like pharma, telecom, industrials, and so on. Um, and I see some questions. Are annotations considered marks or channels? Um, I would say their annotations are neither uh, marks or channels. Um, they are really like just context right to understand the chart. Um, and was this coded using D3? Um, I don't know for sure, but it is very likely that it was coded using D3. Uh, the New York Times um, uses and used a lot of D3. They actually um, were the employer of Mark Bostock who developed D3 for like a significant period of time. Um, and so, especially around 2013, when this happened, like a lot of these charts were actually written by the guy who wrote D3. Um, okay, so now we kind of like can analyze these channels a little bit more. We can uh, say, are these channels selective? So is the mark distinctive from other marks or are they very, can we make out the difference between two marks? So for example, if I have a, a light red and the slightly darker red, they might not be as easy to separate. Um, are they associative? Do they support grouping? So for example, you can see here on the right and also what we talked about when we talked about perception, position supports grouping nicely. We see these kind of like two groups of three points um, and they're, they're nicely grouped. 
Um, are they quantitative? This is kind of like, is it a magnitude versus an identity channel? Can we quantify the difference between two marks? And so here we can clearly, um, quanti uh, we can clearly quantify the difference between those two bars here. Um, is there an order? This is a question again about magnitude versus identity. Can we see a change in order? So here for the bar charts, we can see that. And length, uh, length here means really like not length in the sense of how long is this bar, but how many unique marks can we make? Um, so like how many can we distinguish? And we, I mentioned before that there's only like a limited number of colors that we can easily distinguish, but there's a lot of positions that we can easily distinguish. So these, the, these uh, channels vary by them. So now let's talk about them one by one um, and, 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 and think about them in the term, in these terms, whether they're selective, associative, quantitative, ordered, or how long the vocabulary is here. Position is the strongest visual variable. And this is kind of like the one most important thing that I'm gonna teach you. Um, if you want to encode data, try to use position whenever you can because it is just the most powerful visual variable for many different reasons. I'll actually show you the science behind that um, a little bit later. Position is also suitable for all data types. Um, so like there is nothing that you can't encode by position. However, very often um, you kind of like have multiple things that you want to encode. For example, if you want to encode something on a map, you can't use position because position is also already used by just where the thing is, right? Um, and then there's also a problem of cluttering with positions. So for example, if I have a lot of data points in, in something like a scatter plot that are in the same point, uh, in the same place, uh, then they can clutter um, over each other. But position is selective, associative, quantitative, um, it is ordered and it, it, we have a fairly big vocabulary. So the typical example is the scatter plot. Um, here is an example that shows you uh, the earning, uh, the average earning of men and women for different jobs. This is all interactive. You can, um, you can go to the chart uh, when, I, uh, when, when I upload the slides and you can click on these um, uh, or you can hover over these points and see what exact profession that is. Position also does really only, like all of these great things I just said about position is only really true in 2D. Uh, in 3D, things get much more complicated. Here's a 3D scatter plot. And it, it is really hard to like even, like what is the value of this particular point here, right? Uh, we, we can kind of guess, but we can't really say, is it like 32 or is it 28? And uh, in like in that dimension here, um, it, it, is, it is tricky to just read 3D uh, scatter plots and 3D generally um, has to be used uh, with caution. Uh, length and size, our second uh, channel here, um, is good for 1D, okay for 2D, bad for 3D. So like uh, having the size of a bar um, is fairly easily distinguishable. The size of a, a circle or a rectangle is a little trickier, uh, and the size of a sphere uh, is, is quite difficult to judge. Uh, for 1D length, we can say it's selective, it's associative, it's quantitative, it is ordered, and the, the like, vocabulary the length here is fairly high. So um, I've shown this before when I talked about red-green color blindness. This is again a, like a New York Times visualization, um, and you can see um, the, this encoded here with the size of the bubbles. Uh, value luminance or saturation um, is okay for quantitative data when, when you already use length and size. So for example, if you need to encode, let's say elevation on a map, um, but you can't really recognize very many shades. So it's selective, it's associative, it is uh, quantitative, but it's not as good as the others. It's, there's some problems as I'll demonstrate to you guys later. Um, it is ordered um, and the length of it is limited. So here is an example of uh, using value on this diverging color scale. This is a New York Times project where you can really drill down into like how has your neighborhood voted in the 2016 election. Um, and this encodes this by using a diverging color scale. So you can see the share of Republicans and uh, Democrats in your neighborhood. Um, color is good for qualitative data. Um, it's limited in the number of classes, as I mentioned several times. I can't really only distinguish seven to 10 colors uh, when I want them to work in general. 
It does not work for quantitative data. So we can't say blue is smaller than green is smaller than red. Um, as I, like we had in, so on the perception lecture, there's lots and lots of different pitfalls about color. So be careful about it. And my rule about color is to minimize color use for encoding data and use it for highlighting and brushing and with these kinds of pop-out features that we talked about. So it is selective, it's associative, it's not quantitative, it's not ordered, and we have a limited length. So color, be careful about it. So here's a bad example of a color map. Um, this shows the fraction of precipitation loss to evapotranspiration, the, how, how, free, like, uh, how much uh, water evaporates when it actually rains. Um, and, and it has this very like peculiar color scale um, that isn't particularly meaningful. Um, I guess the goal here is to try um, to show as much nuance as possible, but is brown higher than like say uh, dark blue? I don't know, like you really have to look up the legend for every single thing. Um, and so this is, this is fairly problematic. Here is an example that I already showed in the introduction lecture that is like a great use of color scale. I have only a single color use that highlights an important aspect of this data set, the people that are still actively playing um, football, the quarterbacks that are still actively playing football at the time the chart was made. Um, shape uh, is really great to recognize many classes, but it doesn't allow grouping or ordering. So it is selective. Um, it has limited associative properties. It can't be used for quantitative data. It is not ordered but we have a, like a huge vocabulary. So there's many, many different shea shapes that we can encode. Um, and, and all of them, like they, some of them are meaningful to us, right? Like we can, we immediately recognize all of these signs and these are mostly shapes. Um, and so um, they are like, we can remember them, there's many of them, uh, but they have to be kind of like semantically meaningful that we can tell them apart easily. Um, so there's like this, classic visualization technique um, and th that are called Chernoff faces. And so um, it, 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 we know from like um, psychology that we are very good at distinguishing like facial expressions. So we can actually see how, what, like how people are feeling by just looking at their face. And so um, some statistician in the seventies has thought, wow, we, have, we are so good at distinguishing these particular aspects of how people are looking um, that we could maybe use these facial param parameters to map quantitative data. And so he's come up with like the distance between the eyes and the curvature of the mouth and so on. And you could encode up to like 16 different variables uh, in, uh, in a face. So any thoughts, does that work? Can you kind of tell the difference uh, or can you kind of like tell the data? Um, of like what is the difference between the face in the bottom right and the face in the top left? So yeah, it's really hard to tell, right? So this is like um, the idea is is neat, but it, it kind of fails uh, because uh, we cannot like while we can encode and see differences, we just can't make sense of it, right? We can't tell like what does actually the size of the eye mean versus the like smile, like degree of smiling on the mouth. But I just mentioned this because um, this has been like, um, this is a technique that has been evaluated many, many times and has been studied to death just because somebody came up with it in the seventies. It was one of the founding uh, or one of the early techniques in the field of visualization. And there's of course many, many more channels. So you, you, as, we, as we saw, there is like plenty of different ways of encode data. Um, there's this website that I'm like, there's a link in it. I'm not gonna visit it now in the interest of time, but yeah, plenty of different ways to encode data. So I, I mentioned earlier, um, position is such a great visual variable and length um, and saturation is not and, and, and depth and area are not. And so why is that? So we can actually um, measure that. And this is kind of like goes back to uh, Stevens uh, psychophysical power law. It says the uh, sensation is intensity to the power of n. Um, and so what does that mean? We have a stimulus, like how far two points are apart or how bright something is. Um, and that is proportional to how we perceive it. Um, and the point of this chart here is to say that there is only a single um, stimulus that is linear with respect, oops, this is not linear at all, but 
length here is linear with respect to the physical intensity and how we perceive it. Color saturation, uh, the, uh, it, we tend to over, uh, like we tend to under perceive it. So the physical intensity, um, uh, as the physical intensity uh, grows, we, uh, our perceived sensation of it um, is even higher. And just for, 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 for kind of like fun here, uh, Stephen actually measured this for many different things, uh, including electric shock. Uh, and, and so the physical intensity of electric shock is not linear. Like if you just slightly increase uh, the power of an electric shock, you will feel it much, much stronger. Um, I see there's a hand raised. Yeah, how can you measure like the, what would like, what does the physical intensity of length even mean? Uh, the phys it's, it's, it's just like the stimulus, right? You show somebody a picture, uh, how much, uh, how far is it apart? This is the, the physical stimulus, the physical intensity. So how, how it is really, like how it is in nature in the world that I can objectively measure. So like would a physical intensity of five be five inches and a physical intensity of two be two inches? Is that For kind example, of what it's saying? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so the point is that I can see, like if, if something is four inches versus two inches, um, I can tell it's twice as long. Um, if it's four inches and eight inches, I can still tell it's twice as long. If I have something that is um, like two volts electric shock versus four volts electric shock, I cannot tell that it is twice as much. Uh, it, I perceive it as much more. Um, and so Stephen, as I mentioned, has uh, done this for all kinds of um, different measurements, not only for the ones that we care about visualization. So he measured um, electric shock, heaviness, taste, um, loudness, and smell. Uh, so just like all of the different sensations that we can perceive. So uh, now I want to start a quick poll. Um, I, how much longer here is B than A? Please hit the poll. Okay, the results are in and it's quite impressive. Uh, it is un well, almost unanimous. Um, 65 people and 97% have said it's two times as long and 97% uh, of people are exactly right. Okay, now let's do a new one. How much longer here is B than A? Okay, the numbers are coming in. We have like 90% uh, or 88% say four times and four times is correct. So it's kind of uh, quite impressive to see that like really so many people get that right, even though this is like a bigger thing. How much steeper is A than B? Okay, it's interesting to see that. We have much more disagreement. Uh, we have 57% think it three times. Uh, and then we have also people that think it's, it's uh, two times, four times, five times. Uh, so it's, it is four times as uh, steep. So actually the majority of people uh, got it wrong. What about this one? How much larger is B than A? We have another nice bell curve here. Uh, and it's centered at four times. In fact, it is five times as large. So like uh, what you can see here is that it's much harder to judge area than it is to judge length and position. Uh, here is another example. How much larger is B than A? Okay, uh, most people say four times. And well, it depends on how you think about it. It could be two times, but this is of course by diameter, by area, it's four times. And I'm just saying two times by diameter here, because that's a common mistake that you see if somebody creates an infographic in, uh, let's say Adobe Illustrator, 
um, they commonly like want to map data to some kind of thing that they uh, that they draw, and then the, sometimes they draw this uh, like this the magnitude they want to encode by diameter, and that is of course the wrong thing to do. Like per we perceive uh, the size of the area, not the diameter or the radius or anything like that. Uh, let me skip this one. Um, how much darker is beta A? We have two times, three times, four times, five times. <laughs> okay, people think it's three times. Uh, it is in fact two times, uh, which is like 40% roughly got it right. <laughs> uh, how much darker is speed in A? How we measure that is like, I actually like wrote, I uh, used a, uh, hue saturation value color model and created those charts. So this is like the, the fact here is that this is like a, X times the start. So here people think it's four times and it's actually only three times. So the point here is that um, we have all of these different variables available, uh, but they are very, very different. Uh, and so like, is it alpha corrected? Yes. So like here we're getting into screens and, and like how do we perceive colors and so on? Uh, of course not, um, I, didn't, um, I didn't correct for any environment, but this, is, this is, but this is like true for any time you use color density or darkness, um, um, you, you kind of have to uh, deal with these kinds of issues. The point of this is that uh, you can like see how well everybody did when I asked you to judge length. Everybody got twice as long, perfectly right. Like more than 90% got four times uh, uh, absolutely right, but it was much, much harder with any of the other variables to get it right. Um, here is like a game where you can play these kinds of things. I'm not gonna go into this over again in the interest of time. Um, this asks you to kind of like uh, make these like uh, judge angles and judge length and so on. So uh, please, uh, Play with this if you like. So, okay, hey, where are we? Um, so, there's other factors that affect accuracy. Uh, for example, alignment matters a lot. Um, uh, if we have something that is unframed and unaligned, or framed and unaligned, or unframed aligned, so here, like this here, is is much easier uh, to judge than this here. Um, this here is maybe a little bit easier to judge than the other one here. Um, so because here we can like have, have references, we can compare two things. Here it, it is like they are unaligned. We can still do it, uh, but it is, it, is, it is trickier than if I actually align those two bars. So this kind of like is a little bit about, is it just pure length or is it length and position of the top edge of the bar chart um, at the same time? And then uh, distractors matter, right? So, this is like the judging those two bar charts here to each other is a little bit harder because I have these three things here in the middle compared to this here or the unalignment here, but all the distance matters. So these are again my same two bars, but since they are so far apart, I can actually barely tell that this one here is bigger than this one. So all of these other things, they do matter as well. It's not just as simple that um, length and position is always correct. Um, it it matters, the context always matters. Um, and so now getting into, um, into like, how do we know that? And, and this is where we, we, we go to the paper that we wanted to read for today. Um, the, this, um, this kind of like Kratzer study uh, by, um, that is based on Cleveland McGill, on the Cleveland McGill study. And so Cleveland McGill did this seminal study in 1984 where they asked people uh, about like, is uh, like, what are, um, what are kind of like how, what are the differences between those two, uh, those two bars here? And then they kind of like did this for uh, these bars next to each other, for stacked bar charts, but also for, uh, for things like um, uh, pie charts and for uh, bar charts and so on. Um, and we then have, this paper by Hare and Bostock, uh, which I asked you guys to read. And so what I'll do now is we have like 10 minutes left. I'll set up breakout rooms for five minutes for you guys to discuss this. 
Um, and, and then we'll come back um, and discuss this together. And this is one of these activities. So you can just like write up a brief discussion and submit it to an activity slot uh, for like credit. Okay, let me set up the breakout room. Okay, I will. Here we go. I left my group by mistake when the pop-up came saying there were 60 seconds left. Yep, that happens. I always do that every time. <laughs> I, it's so unfortunate. Yep. Okay, um, I think everybody's back. Um, 
So uh, anybody want to kind of like summarize what this paper is about? Um, I guess I'll take a stab at it. Sure. Uh, my understanding when I read it was that the paper was basically just trying to prove that using uh, this, uh, what was it called, mechanical Turk is an equivalent method to uh, doing uh, more complicated uh, survey experiments when assessing visualization design. That seems to be the main takeaway. The yep. take is kind of interesting, but ultimately I think that's that's the main point. Exactly. So the main point is uh, to evaluate whether crowdsourcing is useful for doing these kinds of perceptual studies uh, where we want to compare things like can like wh what is better like which which visual encoding is better is it like a bar chart or is it a stacked bar chart is it a, like uh, is it like um, circles and uh, on a map or something like that so that is the main point um, who's heard of crowdsourcing before or mechanical Turk crowdsourcing just when you ask lots of people that are not experts in that topic exactly so crowdsourcing is essentially giving tasks to people on the internet and typically paying for it. Um, this is very, very pro like prominent in kind of like uh, labeling for machine learning tasks like object recognition, but it is also very useful for um, psychology experiments, including visualization experiments. Um, and because usually when we back in, before we had crowdsourcing, we would have like mostly do lab studies and we had to like have a student uh, meet with a person that would do an experiment and so it would take weeks and weeks and weeks to get like 50 or 60 people and now with crowdsourcing you can actually like prepare your stimulus ask your questions and like just let 200 people do it and you have your results back within half an hour so what are the kinds of some of the problems that they identified with crowdsourcing here One of the things I think they mentioned was kind of the incentivizing of the crowdsourcing subject. So basically they were going for the cheap wins in order to gain more benefits for them personally, rather than maybe contributing to the subject matter itself. So there they kind of had a fine line between, okay, you have to find the balance to get good quality results where there's just someone you know, who wants to contribute and be done with it. Exactly. That is like one of the big problems of crowdsourcing is when you are in a lab and the a grad student is looking over your shoulder, um, you are like very likely just because of the social environment of the social pressure, you're going to like, try your hardest to actually do the task. But if you're getting paid like 60 cents to do something on the internet where nobody's looking, you might just do like this as quickly as possible uh, to kind of like get as much money as possible out of it and not really engage with the task. And that's something that we see very frequently in crowdsourcing tasks and people have developed strategies against it, but it, it is a problem, right? You can kind of like see that this happens frequently. Like in our lab, we run like a fair amount of crowdsourcing studies and we always notice that. And so lab studies are more reliable um, at the same number, but of course crowdsourcing studies, they are much more like you can get much larger numbers of participants. Uh, is there a way of looking at uh, mechanical Turks and do they give you any data back on like the amount of time that it took to complete said task or the average amount of time or anything like that? Yeah, you can like, um, this is actually a research area for our lab. Um, yes, you can study, like you can track everything uh, about people. Like they, you, you can drop people into a website and you can get all of this information from a browser, right? So you can get like, is the window active or did the person browse away or um, how long did they not move their mouse or how long did it, did it take them to complete a task? And so you can record all of that information and then use it eventually. So it's pretty powerful, um, but it, it is also tricky to do. Um, any other, um, like, so what are the two experiments that they ran uh, in, in this um, paper? The first one was a replication of the original 1984 study. Exactly. And so why did they replicate? Um, 
uh, because those study results were already widely accepted. So replicating that study in a novel environment could prove that the new environment was an appropriate way to conduct that type of research. Exactly. So that was kind of like a smart methodological move. Um, they were able to replicate the findings, um, I think, to like a very high degree of accuracy, uh, which is, of course, nice. You want science to be reproducible. Uh, and they also tested a couple of new things. So kind of they extended it. This is kind of a cool way of doing a replication study, but then extending it slightly. Um, and then you can basically by saying, hey, look, my, my method is trustworthy. So you can also trust these other things that I found. And what was the second study about? So the second study was like one of the big problems uh, is that in a crowdsourced environment, you can control for things like I mentioned earlier, screen luminance, color correctedness, and so on. In the lab, uh, in the lab, everybody's using the same display. You can calibrate your display. You can control the light in the room um, and so on. Uh, but so they, in this study, really looked at can we still use um, crowdsourcing to do things that depend on, on things like alpha contrast. Um, and they found that they can actually do that. It's not quite as precise as in the lab, but maybe it's more ecologically valid. Okay, so I wanna wrap this up. Um, if you, um, you wanna submit this as an activity, just um, give like a brief overview of this discussion. Like don't be too long, write like one paragraph um, just to show that you participated. Um, and, and submit it to one of the five bins. Um, and this is just like an example of a kind of perceptual research that people uh, use to study these kinds of um, things that I talked about for this whole lecture. Okay, um, I'll stop the recording. I'll hang around for 10 minutes in case people have questions.